from the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. We're on. Uh, today is Tuesday, September 20, 2011. My name is Joe Monier of the Southern Oral History Program at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. I'm with videographer John Bishop in Washington, D.C. at the Library of Congress's Jefferson Building. Um, to do an interview for the Civil Rights History Project, which is a joint undertaking of the Smithsonian <coughs> National Museum of African American History and Culture and the Library of Congress. And we have project curator Elaine Nichols of the museum with us today as well. We're delighted to have as our interviewees today Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Ackerman, that is David Mercer Ackerman and Satoko Ito Ackerman. And um, you very generously come in, and, and I know it's on the eve of a big trip you're about to take in a couple of days, so thank you so much for fitting us in. We're, we're very pleased to be with you. It's really a privilege and an honor. Thank you. You are very welcome. Mrs. Ackerman, I thought maybe just to start, if you could talk a little bit about your personal history, where you were born, where you were raised and educated. Oh, goodness. Um, I was raised in Japan, Osaka area, and I was... Um, um, I went through junior and senior high and first year of college at Kobe College in Nishinomiya, near, near Kobe, Japan. Um, and as you may know, Kobe College for Women was uh, started by missionaries some years ago, and so it was a mission school. And that's how I was introduced to, to English and, and to Christianity during those years. And um, I guess at the end of my freshman year in college there, out of a clear blue, one day one of the missionaries, uh, Angie Crew, called me into the office and said, Miss Ito, would you like to go over to the States to study? And, and, and I was just totally taken aback. And, and I said, yes, I would, but I will have to go home and ask my father. <laughs> and, and that's how I came to the States, actually to South Dakota, to Yankton, South Dakota, to Yankton College. Um, this turned out to be a project of a uh, um, South Dakota conference of congregational churches. They wanted to have someone from some other country come and share their life with them. And so that's how I ended up coming to the United States. You arrived in South Dakota? In 1959, August. Mm -hmm. And I went, to, went through Yankton College and then to uh, seminary. Well, actually, after Yankton, I went home and a uh, conference called, i uh, not called, wrote and said, there is still more fund in TOCO fund, so if you wanted to come back to do a graduate work, we can do it. And so I came back to do seminary. Right. Uh, we'll pick back up in a moment at that point, but Mr. Ackerman, let me invite you to offer the same kind of perspective on your... Okay, background. well, it's probably more ordinary than what my wife has experienced, but I was uh, born and raised in a small town in uh, Illinois, Mount Carroll, small farming uh, community, 2,000 uh, people. Um, as I uh, got into my teenage years, I, f I found the community to be very stifling and could not wait to, to move out. Uh, but looking back on it, it was just a terrific place to grow up. It was um, a safe but free environment. You know, I mean, as, as kids, we could things didn't have to be organized. You know, we made up things on our on, on our own and could go any place and do anything our imaginations came up with, except. We couldn't get into any serious trouble because if we did anything untoward, somebody would call our mother because everybody knew everybody. <laughs> so it was a great little town. And, um, and I went from there to um, Knox College in Galesburg, Illinois, not too far away, but far enough, and um, majored there in uh, history and political science. Um, and during my senior year, uh, a fairly traumatic event happened. My, uh, my brother committed suicide uh, because he was, uh, he was gay 
but he had uh, taken part in ROTC when he had been in college and owed a commitment to Uncle Sam. And so was uh, uh, in ranger training at Fort Benning, Georgia, when our beloved military discovered that he was gay and he was, he was uh, uh, threatened with uh, dishonorable discharge at that time. And I think he simply could not accept uh, uh, the shame of that. Well, that, that just knocked the legs out from under me. And I was just kind of a lost soul. And a friend of mine who was in, in seminary, at Chicago Theological Seminary, just suggested that I, that I go there. Uh, so that's, that's what I did. And uh, uh, that turned out to be a life-changing experience as well. It was exactly the right place for me to be at that time. So. Um, let me ask each of you, um, uh, kind of when you first had your mind turned towards the question of race relations in the United States, I th think it has to be when the idea of going down to Selma was, was introduced. Up until then, I hadn't really been aware of any conflict or any differences between people in the United States. I'd kind of embraced the entire culture and I, I just did not know anything about it until I saw the film of Bloody Sunday on TV and, and Jesse talked about our need to go down and, and none of that was kind of on my radar before. Oh, I take it back at Yankton College, uh, there were a few African students, two or three. Yankton College was small, like 200, 300 students. And two or three students were from Africa. And when they, I t was told when they went down to the town to get a haircut, they couldn't get a haircut. And at that time, we were all outraged. And I did not understand the meaning of this at all. But I recall at the time thinking, you know, partly that was because they were um, foreign students, maybe, but then also I was aware that they were black and that there was some discrimination, but that kind of went sort of one part of my brain and went out until Selma came. Had you yourself experienced any uh, difficult situations as a, as a visiting Japanese student? As a matter of fact, no. Not absolutely no, and that in itself was looking back kind of a surprise because uh, it was back in 59 and I was totally, totally accepted and, and I just felt that was the way it was supposed to be and never thought anything differently. Jacqueline, did, did, did Carol and uh, Mount Carol, excuse me, Mount Carol, No, it was uh, basically a lily white uh, uh, community. It had, a, it had an air of uh, tolerance and non-discrimination about it, but it, it was not often put to the practical test of how that worked out. Uh, while I was in high school, there was a black family that finally moved into Mount Carroll, and you know I thought it was I thought it was welcomed and graciously received. But you know it was predominantly white experience, and I I did not grow up with a great awareness of of uh, race relations and the history of that uh, mm -hmm. in this country. Mm -hmm. Did that tragedy of your brother, was it anything at the time that, um, that, that, that you interpreted in any way through a political lens beyond the personal tragedy? I did not. I did not. I was so deeply immersed in just my own personal grief at that point that I, I didn't see the broader dimension. And it really took me quite a while before I, uh, before I did see the political uh, dimension to it. Yeah. So, so I, I gather that the two of you likely met in Chicago. Yes, oh, as a matter did. of fact, yes, yes. Some, Toko had come there uh, the semester before I arrived, but yes, we fairly quickly found each other that, uh, that year and did fall in love. And, that was, and we were in that relationship when Selma mm -hmm. happened. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm interested just in your perspective about uh, years at, at uh, Theological Seminary. Was the, the question of race relations didn't present itself in some fashion into the midst of that? 
moral well, community moral liberation? In, in, in a sense, it did, um, and in part because of the location of the seminary. Uh, Chicago Theological Seminary is on the campus of the University of Chicago uh, in Hyde Park, and uh, just across the, uh, the Midway was the uh, um, community of uh, Woodlawn, which was a uh, uh, predominantly black community and, and very economically depressed and, and uh, somewhat uh, violent, and there were um, you know, some of the some of the clinical activities that students took part in did take did take us into the into the black parts of, of Chicago. So yeah, we began to become somewhat aware. Can you, know. can you say a little bit more about that, the kind of things you saw and how that what your impressions at the time were, as, as you can recall them? Well, it was really just uh, seeing the poverty, the, just the extent of poverty and the, the difficult living situations that uh, that people had. I mean, I, I'd just not been exposed to a big city uh, before, and I was just kind of a struck by how different the north side of Chicago was from, uh, from the south side. Uh, for, for a naive, small town Midwestern boy, it was, uh, it was a revelation. Mm. If you can, t taking you, the, the both of you, if you would please, kind of through those years of the early 60s and up towards uh, the spring of 65. Mm. Um, well, it, 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 from the civil rights perspective, it was just a, just a terrific, uh, half decade and full decade, in fact. I mean, we have been through uh, Birmingham and the march on Washington and uh, Montgomery boy boycott back in the 50s. Not that I was terribly aware or engaged with, uh, with those. Um, Kennedy came into office and I really resonated with, with Kennedy and his dynamism and his uh, call to public service, um, in a sense, and that played a role in, in my future uh, career ambitions. But it really wasn't until uh, the Selma event occurred that it began to become a personal uh, issue. Uh, and then it, was, then it was almost accidental. Uh, and the accidental part of it was that Jesse Jackson was part of my seminary class. Uh, he was already uh, deeply involved in the civil rights movement, already a very accomplished preacher, but he had never gotten any formal seminary training. So he had come to CTS to, uh, to do that. Um, Bloody Sunday occurred on uh, March 7th, uh, 1965, uh, just, a, just a brutal and fortunately well-covered uh, event. Uh, Southern Leadership Conference, Southern Christian Leadership Conference and others had decided to make Selma a focal point for an effort to get voting rights legislation uh, enacted. That, that's the one piece that had been omitted for the 1964 Civil Rights uh, Act. And so the technique was to create, uh, create confrontation, uh, but to deal with it in a nonviolent manner and call upon uh, uh, the moral conscience of, of uh, uh, people whose conscience could be, could be reached. Um, the seminary had a, uh, uh, a weekly convocation on either, and I forget whether it was Sunday night or Monday night, uh, where it was just a gathering of the faculty and the students. And, uh, and at that <coughs> week's conversation, uh, Jesse, in effect, commandeered uh, the meeting and uh, in his uh, very powerful style, just made, made Selma a, a personal moral issue for us. Uh, Dr. King had issued his call for all people of goodwill uh, to come to Selma, uh, especially people in, in the ministry or related to the ministry, uh, and Jesse, Pose that issue to us. Uh, if he was going, who would go? Who would go with him? Um, do you want to add anything to that? At well, that point? I felt it very personally. I must go. I really need to go and stand up for against this violence that was happening. And I didn't think, you know, a woman, a girl. <laughs> foreign student, what could I have done anything? And it just didn't occur to me. After Jesse spoke, it was as though I just had to go. Mm -hmm. And Dave, as a matter of fact, kind of got upset with me <laughs> for deciding to go because we were dating. And uh, he felt that he would go, but if I had been, you know, there he would felt like I had to take care of, he, he had to take care of me or something. 
And I felt that that was wrong, that I needed to go for myself. <laughs> and so I went, and also a girlfriend, Ginny, um, now Ramsey Griffith, uh, she and I, and I guess the rest were men from students from the seminary, but, but my feeling was that, that it was a call was directly to me. Something about that that I just couldn't say no. Mm. Saying at, this, mm. at this weekly convocation. Um, can you tell me what you recall of Jesse Jackson as a young man in that context and as a mm. classmate? And mm. yeah. Well, I felt Jesse was self-important. <laughs> 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 I, I felt, dis <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I, on, it, on the other hand, when he spoke that night, somehow uh, I didn't know Jesse really personally un until then, before then, and I just saw him as, as kind of a, uh, very conscious of, of what he was about. And somehow that night he became more than, than kind of superficial person. It seemed to me he was so uh, sincere and so from his heart he wanted to, to do this and he wanted to have some of us uh, go with him because it is the right thing to do. So something about what that night, what he said and how he said it uh, made a difference in the way I responded. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Ackman, did you have a, a, a how, how do you recall Jesse Jackson in those years oh, as a classmate? Very much in the same terms. There was a, uh, what, a quality of vanity about uh, Jesse that just was very, uh, very evident. Uh, but like Soko, I did not know him uh, at all well, even though we were in the same class and must have shared the same uh, classes oftentimes during that time, but I just have no recollection of that. But that, that night in the convocation, Jesse became, became a leader, and uh, mm -hmm. he just spoke with such, uh, such passion mm -hmm. and such, such integrity um, that it was impossible not to, not to respond to it in some fashion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. would, there, would there have been, in the course of your um, training in seminary, would there have been either formally or informally discussions of race and gender that, that were mm -hmm. in, in play at that time? Mm -hmm. Oddly enough, I don't recall. I don't recall either. Um, but there was a, um, a course on kind of the sociology of Chicago where we, where we dealt with you know, ecological barriers and other things in, mm -hmm. in city life. And so yeah, there were discussions there, but I don't recall it elsewhere. Okay. Was your... Um, was that impulse, your, your mm -hmm. first impulse in Sacrament noted about your concern about her perhaps joining on this trip to Selma, was it, was it the prospect of violence or other issues? That oh, I think it was the prospect of violence. Mm -hmm. yeah. And mm -hmm. I, was, I was playing the traditional male role of being the protector, uh, you know, and as, as Toko has uh, continuously educated me, that is not necessarily <laughs> uh, needed or desired, so. <laughs> But yes, I, I, did feel, I did feel a responsibility for, uh, for taking care of Toko, and I, I thought that would make, uh, make the whole trip much more difficult. Mm -hmm. yeah. Let me invite you to tell the, to tell the story of how um, you moved from that appeal by Jesse Jackson mm -hmm. to actually departing from Chicago, how many people and how you arranged mm -hmm. the travel and those kinds of things. I simply went along. Somehow Jesse and s some of the other guys arranged everything. There were 12 of us, I'm told, and two cars, two, I think was station wagon or oh, van two, two or vans, vans yeah. something, which belonged to two of the students that went. And uh, we went in caravan with Illinois license plate, 
integrated, Jesse integrated, the, the, the rest of us were, well, I guess I am sort of a part of a non-white, but I didn't see myself as, as differently. And we s drove through the whole trip. We did, people t took turns driving. I remember different people driving different cars and we just kept going. And yeah. The parts of the, the country that I hadn't seen. It was about, uh, what, 650 miles, I think, from Chicago to Selma, something like that. Of course, no expressways back then, so it was a fairly, fairly tedious, uh, you know, two-lane road kind, mm -hmm. of, uh, kind of trip. Um, but l let me just say a word about the moral wrestling that students had to go through. Mm -hmm. Because uh, that was, the decision was paid, uh, uh, the challenge was uh, placed to the entire community, and 12 of us said yes. A lot of other students wanted to say yes, say and yes, yet yes. Went, you know, for, for a variety of reasons, uh, couldn't. But one of, one of my mm -hmm. most, and I think our most vivid memories, is a, is a very good friend of ours who was a student there from uh, Texas. Amarillo, Texas, and yeah. He, he and just, he just knew that if he went, uh, he would be disowned by his parents, and any financial support for seminary would be would be terminated. And boy, he just he just agonized over that, yeah. and eventually made the decision not to go. Uh, but just I think has in some ways always regretted yeah. regretted that yeah. decision. But it was it was a difficult choice. Did, did, did each of you put the question to your parents prior to departing? Or? No. no. No, well, as no. a matter of fact, I don't know if my parents ever knew, mm -hmm. because by the by that time I was that independent, and I have been making decisions separately from my parents since I came, and it came as a you know my decision, no permissions asked or or even thought, but when this friend was struggling with, but he could or could not do because but his parents might feel he felt this will just make his parents die inside if he were to do that and i understood i think his decision not to go was even stronger than my decision to go because he struggled so much mm -hmm. I think my parents um, might have been supportive, but I wasn't willing to test that out. Uh, afterwards, they were they were reasonably supportive, and I, I did not have financial support at issue because I was there at, on scholarship, so that was that was not a question. So. Was there any um, debate among students uh, at the seminary as to the merits of it? I mean, were there mm -hmm. folks who said, "Oh, it's a bad idea. I wouldn't go." Uh, uh, as far as I know, nobody ever said that it was a bad idea. Everybody accepted it as a as a moral challenge. I mean, we were we were seminary students, you know. Yeah. We were studying theology yes. and what it means yes. to be a moral and ethical uh, person. Yeah. What kind of people we were. So, no, nobody questioned the, the validity of of the call. So. But the president of the seminary, Dr. Schomer, at the time, uh, told us it's not a good idea to go. Don't go. And because the, because the finals or midterm or something was coming up, mm -hmm. and our place was here to study, here at the seminary and study. And he himself was going, but he did not feel that st students' place was there when violence could possibly be an issue. Did you understand that argument that he made as being made sincerely, or did you think he had other concerns, too? Well, at the time, I really didn't take his word at heart. I did not feel that that was the case for me, that I felt that I was needed there and needed to go. Uh, yeah, well, same, same reaction. <coughs> uh, I, just, I just really didn't pay any attention to his words. And I, I don't, 
candidly, I don't think any of us really, really took what he said seriously. seriously. Yeah. One more question I forgot to ask about, <coughs> yeah. the, about the seminary community. How many non-white students were there amongst all those enrolled? Oh, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. um, it was not a great number. Very few. Um, but I, I'm, I don't know. really know. Maybe, maybe just 10, 15 percent at, mm -hmm. at most. Oh, but even as much as that, though. Yeah. So yeah. how many African Americans would you guess were in the community of, of students? Well, maybe that's a high estimate. I'm not sure. What do you recall? Well, I can think of three or four people. Yeah. And the total enrollment at any time would have been approximately mm. beyond that, I don't know. 70, yeah. 80 people, perhaps. Yeah. In the various mm -hmm. classes. Yeah. 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 Right. Tell, me, tell me about what you, uh, <coughs> what you saw and what you did when you arrived in Selma. Well, Before we right. got to Selma. Right. <coughs> yeah, we were, what do you want to do? Yeah. At one point, we stopped at the gas station once we, I think we must have been somewhere in the, in so I'm in Alabama we were, by we then. Across the state <coughs> line. Yeah. Yeah. And then we were pumping they were guys were pumping gas and Ginny and I got out of the, the car and we were sort of walking around the station and um, we were totally oblivious to what was happening. And Jesse, all of a sudden, what I recall was all of a sudden Jesse shouting, "Get in the car!" And and you know I didn't understand what was going on, but we immediately obeyed and got in the car. And he said, "Ackerman, you drive," or something like that. And we drove, and I, I, we asked what was happening, and um, somebody explained that. Uh, some white guys were loitering in the station, and we or somebody spotted them. And one of the the guys went into the the payphone and started calling. And that's when Jesse said to get in the car, and we just took off very fast. And some car did follow us for quite a while, and we somehow got away. Yeah, I think they just uh, turned off at one point. Mm. And shortly after that, uh, we, we stopped and <laughs> we had brought along uh, ministerial collars, you know, Back, even though you we were know, not ordained. Uh, but yeah. at that point, we put on those ministerial collars for, for whatever. Probably first time in your life. Oh, and, and <laughs> yeah, that's very true. And uh, for whatever protective uh, help mm. those might, might provide. But that, that, was the, yeah. that was the most memorable yeah. incident going down. Otherwise, we just we just drove straight through, just straight through the night. Yeah. Our recollection is we left what, Tuesday mid afternoon, something, and arrived in Selma uh, sometime early morning or midday on Wednesday. Yeah. yeah. So describe the what you discovered in Selma. Yeah. Right. Well, it was an extraordinary uh, scene, in effect. I mean, I, I guess the first thing that uh, that struck me in Selma was just the the stark difference between mm. the white side of town and the black yes. side of town. <laughs> I mean, you enter the black side of town and suddenly the streets are no longer paved and there are no longer sidewalks. Street lights, no street well, lights there. And, you know, <laughs> and the houses all look pretty shabby and just, there, there just simply was no evidence of public services on the black, <laughs> black side of town. It kind of looked... We're rolling. Okay, we're back after a short break. Okay. So, Ms. Ackerman, Ms. Ackerman, you were saying that, that you see these stark differences in the community. Yeah. And it's yeah. And, and then we got to the uh, got to the church, and uh, you know just all kinds of people milling around the church, white and black. And, was this Brown Chapel? It was Brown Chapel, yes. right, yes. right. But I don't uh, specifically remember what happened uh, that afternoon, except at some point, um, a, a rally began at church, and, and people <laughs> began kind of uh, rousing rousing the crowd, and and uh, in preparation for hearing from Dr. Dr. King. And uh, of course, the church was overflowing with uh, with Phil, people at that point. Just to the rafters, it yeah. was people everywhere, and lots and lots of black people who must be a part of the Brown Chapel community. And we had so much singing. It was it was when I first really encountered mm -hmm. great singing of of uh, civil rights. Now. 
civil rights era songs and, and music happens now and then, but never like that. It was mm -hmm. just so powerful. And that's also where we uh, heard about Jim Reeb, uh, who was a Unitarian minister who had come down very quickly in response to Dr. King's uh, call, and he had walked into the white part of the community uh, for dinner on Tuesday night, and he and his companion, I forget whether there were one or two companions, had all been uh, beaten, uh, he most brutally, uh, that night, and was, was lying in critical condition at the hospital at, at that hour. How did you, uh, how did your group from Chicago, how did you sort of integrate yourself into the wider community and what was anticipated in mm -hmm. terms of action going forward? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure, it was kind of vague. I think the people of the church was so welcoming, I do remember that. They talked to us and, you know, thanked us so profusely, it made me feel like I, I was uh, so appreciated, appreciated, you know, I have never been so appreciated. <laughs> Everybody who would come, you know, who would be there would come up and say, thank you for being here, you know, thank you for supporting us, and, and that I, I remember. And they fed us a lot. They kept bringing different food, and there was station, you know, tables, and, and it was never empty, you know, they kept bringing things, and, and um, uh, somehow we were their guests, and that was so evident, because somehow at the end of that evening, can we go there? I was, Ginny and I were uh, told by some women in the church saying, you are com go coming with us, and, the, and somebody said these are two school teachers who had built a house somewhere outside, outskirts of Selma, and they will take care of you for the night. And so we were taken to their home, uh, and it was very new, right, uh, you know, uh, and not much furniture except for a bed and a couple of chairs or something like that. And then they, you know, made sure that we were comfortable and and then I think they left and Ginny and I slept and in the morning when we got up a group of people walked in and asked did you sleep well is was everything okay and and we said yes it was and thank you so much for hospitality and and they said we were really worried so we stayed guard and they were, somebody from the family throughout the night stayed outside to make sure we were safe. And, and that just really, I was so moved that they did that for us. And we slept, didn't even know. Yeah, what were the arrangements for uh, it was different. Uh, I, I stayed in a, uh, a, the home of uh, someone who was in the black uh, community. Well, uh, it seemed like, well, than yours was? Yeah, it was. Yeah, okay, yes. okay. Uh, it seemed like public housing. Uh, in, in, uh, in, I'm not sure that it was, but it, it seemed like public housing. And, and it, you know, the people, well, as Toko has said, they were, they were just incredibly gracious to us throughout and just seemed to take such good care of us, both in terms of feeding us and housing us and just making us feel uh, very wel welcome and very appreciated. And that night, I guess for the first time, I just began to hear stories about mm -hmm. what life was like in Selma for, for the black community. The, oh, the rapes that would occur, uh, the periodic uh, uh, lynchings of, uh, of young men. Uh, and just got the sense that uh, there was no justice system that operated. Was it a, um, how active was the climate of, um, of concern for your safety? Ms. Ackerman, you mentioned that, that you awoke in the morning to discover that persons had, had watched the house mm -hmm. overnight. Mm -hmm. um, Ms. Ackerman, did you go to, did you 
retire that night sort of act, actively concerned about your personal safety in that moment, or? You know, oddly enough, I didn't. Um, although Ginny and I had uh, walked around the, the edge of the, where the black and white, the edge of the community uh, existed and found ourselves, uh, the victims, I guess, of just uh, the most uh, vile and uh, evil uh, accusations from white youth just on the other side of, of the line. And I, we had not heard about Jim Reeb yet, and somehow I was blacking out on what had occurred on Bloody Sunday, and, and for some reason I did not yet feel a sense of personal uh, endangerment. It's very peculiar. Tell me about what then ensued in your in your stay in uh, mm -hmm. in, in Selma. Well, we failed to mention about the rally. Dr. King yes, spoke please, to us, please. and that was the I think my first real uh, hearing of Dr. King right up there mm -hmm. and talking, and he was powerful, and. Uh, he said that, that we will get through this, all of us together, and, and we were, so many of us from outside were here friends to uh, help, and he thanked those people whose conscience brought them there. And then he said that he would like to be with us when we do the march, but that he had to be appearing at a court somewhere, and he will not be with us then in body, but he will be with us all the way uh, in spirit, and that uh, Reverend Abernathy would be leading the, the march at that point. There had been, uh, my understanding was that there had been an attempted march on uh, Tuesday, uh, which had gotten to the foot of the, of the Pettus Bridge, but, uh, but no further. And so then there was going to be another attempted march on uh, Thursday. Um, didn't quite know where it was going to go, but the most uh, vivid memory is how, is how we were arranged in the line of march. And you may want to talk about this, right? Well, uh, we were told we needed to form a, a march, and I had never known what that meant. And right outside the church on this dirt road, we all lined up. And the way we lined up was black women were all in the middle. And they were first, you know, they stood up and they lined up maybe three or four abreast. And then black men were on both sides of that. And then there were those, you know, white women and I, was in that, in those roles. And then um, men who were, you know, white men were on the outside and, and we were all kind of my, maybe 15 to 20 of rest this way. And very orderly, you know, everybody was, I, I guess we had been told we should be wearing our Sunday best. Mm -hmm. So I think I must have been wearing uh, flats and skirt and things of that nature. And, and then it was towards the dusk, I, I think. Mm -hmm. It was kind of getting dark. But then we, when we lined up, when, when the formation was done, they said, uh, now lock your arms. And so we were told to lock arms. And when we did that, it was just almost like electricity went through my body from you know, this way to this way. It was the most powerful thing I've ever, ever experienced. And although I was afraid, well, I was afraid because of the implications from what I had seen on TV and what I was told but also when we stood up, all of a sudden there were these troopers on both sides of this formation. There were 
um, Alabama troopers with sunglasses which were, were reflective glasses which you could not see their faces and they were wearing a, you know, a helmet and then they stood like this with the baton and they looked so fierce, they looked so fierce and they were everywhere. They were all of a sudden after we stood up, they were surround, surrounding us and and then yet when we locked arms, I felt like you know, I could do anything with, with this group of people. And that was the most um, memorable thing about it, that I was there to protect, but I was there protected. Mm -hmm. and, and so then, we were, we, somebody said, let us march. And we walked maybe three or four steps at the most. And then some booming voice said, you may not go any further. And I think it must have come from the head of the troopers. Jim Clark. Jim Clark. And, and then it stopped. And I heard Abernathy, Reverend Abernathy say, let us pray. And then we all got down on our knees. And uh, that was as far as the, the march ever went. From there on, it was through the whole night of um, visual, different preachers, getting up and praying, and then we would sing, and, and then somebody else would say something, and, and then there would be long, long hours of just people talking to us. And, and that's when I heard for the first time what it was like to be living in the South in America. And and these were kind of uh, an amazing life stories that would never, I never would have imagined happening possible. Somebody going to go and, and register to vote, um, which took apparently a great, great deal of courage to begin with. And then when they get there, um, they were simply found, they couldn't do, write something or, you know, made up reasons why they could not stay and, and be registered. They, they get turned home. And uh, those were the, not the only things. They started telling us about how their, uh, friend's daughter was raped or, or and how they were abused in different ways. And a uh, whole night of stories like this, and yet people uh, didn't seem they, have, they were going to give up about this life. And kept saying, you know, we are glad you're here to help us get this through. So we will win. And I, I have very similar uh, recollections with one difference, uh, maybe, uh, as, a, as a white man, I had been given the place of honor on the outside of the, of the line of march. And, and that's when I first felt fear. I think I really felt uh, very, very vulnerable, and uh, uh, recollections of Bloody Sunday became very vivid in my mind at uh, uh, at that point. Uh, my recollection is not that we were surrounded by troopers, but that there were troopers across the road where we intended to uh, to march, uh, dressed exactly as as Toko said, looking very. Uh, uh, intimidating and impersonal because you just could not see their eyes. Yeah. Uh, 
But the other thing that became very important during the night was that the uh, journalists were also there, including the TV, TV networks with their lights, uh, which they kept on all night, night long. long. And I, I think that was, that was our guardian angel, I think it was those lights, those journalists, because uh, otherwise I think it, it could have been a very bloody, brutal scene mm -hmm. once again. Mm -hmm. uh, but that, that night was just an extraordinary, uh, extraordinary night. And I came out of it with uh, such immense respect for Dr. Abernathy. Um, I mean, I think, you know, I think as a, as a leader of the SELC, Dr. Abernathy was always a little bit bumbling and, and perhaps not the world's greatest organizer, but my God, could the man pray. Um, oh, he was amazing. He just, he just kind of had a direct pipeline to, to God. And, uh, and he was the one that kept, kept that whole march together. I mean, it, it, was, really, it was really him and, and nobody else. And then, um, towards the early morning, the sun came up and shortly after that or about that, uh, Nathy told us to get up and he said, let us sing our national anthem. And so we all got up and, and started singing, oh say can you sing? And that's when I noticed the troopers didn't know what to do because they were, as I recall, they were all standing, still wearing a baton, but they were still wearing their helmets. And they didn't know whether to keep the helmets on or they should do something decent <laughs> and take it off or what I think some of them really were in great quandary. And so they started looking <laughs> at each other and kind of whispering or, you know, they were looking and, and I could, we could see their, you know, quandary. And so then everybody finally looked to Jim Clark and he looked so flustered. <laughs> and he took his helmet finally off, mm -hmm. he went like this, and everybody else immediately, you know, went like that. And they didn't sing, but they, at the times, to me, it felt like there was a commu communication. There was a community that went beyond this this, these people who were marching, that it changed something. It was, it was a wonderful moment. Um, and uh, in, in, in a small way, just kind of represented what the whole nonviolent movement was about. Because uh, King and, and others just, you know, the, the address was not only to the oppressed, but to the oppressor. And, and, um, and it called, tried to call forth the better angels of our, of our natures. And at that moment, you know, a little bit, a little bit of that happened. That's, that's such a, the irony is embedded in that, or just so many. It's just, yeah. 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 Um, I'm interested, um, Mr. Ackerman, let me ask, let me put this question to you. You're interested, there, there's a, there's obviously a, a spectrum of emotion in play here from real terrible oh, yeah. despair to, you know, mm -hmm. Mr. Ackerman, you mentioned this moment of just feeling so electric and, with promise and power of yeah. a whole group together. Yeah. And I wonder how, I wonder if there was, I guess my question is, was it, was it a, a wide jumble of feeling or was there any crystallization of one sort or another as you went through an experience like that? I, I don't remember any uh, any roller coaster of, of uh, emotion. Uh, once we, you know, walked our three or four steps and then came to a halt and uh, began to engage in the all-night vigil. We were just caught up in, caught up in the vigil. Um, I think any sense, for me at least, any sense of fear disappeared. I was still very aware of the lights and the role that they were playing. But it was, the, the whole night was just such an uplifting uh, spiritual experience. 
and I process it, processed it afterwards. And the way I felt about it was that that was the community of atonement. Mm -hmm. That somehow all the disparate people, you know, different people came together in March, March towards justice and truth. And somehow at that moment, those of us who were, who had locked arms and marched together created a community of atoning. And so atonement in the sense of healing, atonement in the sense of, of bringing together all of the ills which produced new life in a way. And, and so that's why that particular march kind of is a paradigm for my life that it's, it became a, a most important aha moment for me. I wrote my thesis after I came back from that uh, march on the uh, atoning community in the nursery school children because I was working with children. And, but the, the whole idea was when you really work as one, as a community, things can happen. What, um, I guess this would have carried you through to Friday then. Is that right? Carried through to Friday, and uh, my recollection becomes very vague at that mm -hmm. point. Uh, my recollection is that we went out to uh, breakfast, the 12 of us and Jesse Jackson, and uh, Jesse had arranged for um, Jim Farmer, uh, head of Congress of Racial Equality, uh, to join us. And uh, what we talked about, I'm not quite sure, but you know, Jim was also a very dynamic person in his own right, so I'm sure it was a very Although we were probably all pretty sleepy at that point too, but I'm sure it was a very good, very good discussion. And then after that, we we left for, for home. With Jesse Jackson. Left just yeah. after breakfast. And yeah. he came. He yeah, returned yeah, with yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah, he was a part yeah, of yeah. Jesse came with us. Yeah. Right. But my recollection, for some reason, mm -hmm. is that uh, Alabama troopers' cars led the way, escorted the cars out. And really? I don't know why really? I remember mm. that. Mm. I, I don't have that mm. recollection. And I don't mm. remember that breakfast mm. happened after. Right. So, you know, yes. it, it, mm. but how the... Yeah, it's memory. Memory. Sure. yeah. Mm. I wish I had written it down, but... Your return to Chicago was uneventful? It was yeah, completely, was a, completely uh, uneventful. Yeah. Right, yeah. right. Um, let me just invite your, your sort of long view now of, of those of the, the, those hours and days in, in Selma and your sense of kind of how you came to integrate that and, and mm. find what meaning you placed upon it and so forth. Of course, we've touched on some of these mm. themes already, but in the broadest sense, I'm, I'm just interested in your thoughts and comments. Well, in, um, I guess there are a number of different ways of, of coming at it. One is, one is that it's just been an extraordinary, uh, what, 60 years, half century for civil rights in this country. Uh, and not just for not just for uh, uh, the black members of our society, but you know it went from there to uh, to women's liberation, from there to the disabled and handicapped, and finally to uh, to gays, lesbians, and uh, transgender. We, we meet today on the very. I'll just note for the tape. It's as you are well aware, the first oh. day of the U.S. military no longer is. Yes. Um, and uh, given what happened to my brother, I, uh, I, I celebrate this day. It's yes. been too long in coming. Yes. The don't ask, don't tell yeah. rule now is abolished yeah. in the U.S. Yeah. military as yeah. of today. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, Could not be more thrilled with that happening. Right. Yeah. Uh, in personal terms, I guess what what most what most stayed with me was just just the. Uh, just a clear absence of, uh, of, of a justice structure in, uh, in Selma, mm -hmm. and uh, just the uh, incredible disparity between uh, the black and the white uh, communities. Uh, and I, that played a role in my eventually dropping out of seminary but choosing to go to law school instead, 
and uh, kind of responding to Kennedy's call to go into public service in some manner. So that's how I eventually ended up with, you know, first I worked for the Washington office of the National Council of Churches and did uh, not so much civil rights stuff, but anti-poverty advocacy work and then moved into congressional research um, service. So, but, all, but behind it all, of course, has also been uh, do what Dr. King uh, stood for and this, um, but, you know, it's a call that, that just, uh, there's been nobody that has embodied uh, that kind of call for at one moment or reconciliation or, um, you know, just the call to the better angels of our nature in as powerful a form as Dr. King did. So I just feel privileged to have actually been exposed to that in some small way. After we came to Washington, D.C., and we ended up living in a suburb where we are now, um, one of the experiences was that the racial issues hasn't really finished, that, that there are discrimination still and this was, uh, I'm, it, this is, how many years ago would it have been we were, we had just been at Bradford Road, maybe it's 19, early 70s? Yeah, that's when we were at Bradford Road, right? Yeah. During the whole decade. Yeah. And after we were living there for a while, it was all white community, and Across the street from us moved in uh, a black family with two children. And uh, I was so delighted and, and so we invited, you know, that little girl. I, and I said, there are five girls in the house behind us. So, you know, I will introduce you and you can play with them. And so then she, you know, went over and was so excited and uh, came back a few minutes later. Oh, no, and she played with them and they had a good time. Next day she came over and she went out back to the, the family again and, and a few minutes later she came back and she was totally totally crestfallen and she was so sad and uh, I said what happened and she said they won't play with me and I said well why you had such a good time yesterday and and then she said well they told me that that their father told them that I can't come and play anymore and I got so angry, I was so upset. First of all, to have put Vera in that place. And, and then second of all, for this family to, to have discriminated in, in uh, something, I, I just was unprepared for this. And so I marched out there, and I gathered the, the girls together, and oldest was 12, 13, something like that. And, and um, I said, why can't Vera play with you? And she said, well, our father said that she can't come to our house because she's black. And I said, I don't really believe that that is right, but if your father tells you this, I know you can't do you know, what he tells you not to do. But when you come and play at our yard, which is between the two yards, and they came all the time to play at our yard, when you are in our yard, you will have to play with anybody who is there, which includes Vera. And, and they said, you know, okay. And uh, uh, as I remember, 
they did do that a few times. But that's when I realized that things were not all finished and, and rights of people and, and equality and all of the things that we have worked for still continues. That we need to be vigilant because it happens in a little ways that, that affect little children and how we pass on prejudice. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Ms. Ackerman, the, the, just generally speaking, that community was located where and the name was? Silver Spring. Oh, Silver Spring, Maryland. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. it's, a, it's a singular Silver Spring. Oh, Silver Spring. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we do in, have the Silver Spring. Okay, but this is the singular and it's in Maryland also? Maryland, okay. yes. It's so it's more or less suburban Washington. Northern suburb. Yeah. 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 Just, just across the border. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 10 miles of, from White House. Right. Yeah. Part, part of Montgomery County. Yeah. yeah. So. Um, I, I really want to thank you for coming in to share these recollections and this history. It's just um, wonderful for us to have it, and it's been a real honor and a privilege. Any final thoughts? Just that the uh, battle goes on. I mean, I look at what's happening with uh, what, what's happened for decades with the drug laws and uh, how that's been used against the black community, and now with uh, new attempts to limit uh, voting rights. I mean, it, you know, somehow. Somehow that, that boulder keeps having to be pushed up the mountain. Well, let me thank you both so much. It's been well, a real, real well, thank you. It's been a, been a privilege for us. Thank you for thank having you us. Thank you very much for letting us tell the story. Thank you. Mm -hmm. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture.